Great. How are you guys doing so far? Good? All right. Very good. Uh, my talk is going to be a little bit in, uh, different than uh, what you just uh, attended. Uh, hopefully, you'll still find it interesting. Hopefully, it'll be relevant to you no matter where your career paths lie. And I say that because um, I'm talking about something that'll be relevant to you sometime between one and seven plus years from now when you're trying to enter the real world, when you're trying to get a job. So we're going to talk about how you get a job, how you start a career, how you continue a career. And on my title slide, I put the word media in parentheses because, you know, we're all here today because presumably you have some interest in film or television production or being in front of the camera, something in that realm. That's not necessarily what you're going to do with your life. So almost everything that I'm going to talk about today can be transformed, can be related to outside of media. It's just I'm in media, so that's what I can uh, talk about best. Uh, I'll introduce myself. My name is Dan Zaro. I am the chief meteorologist for Town Square Media, New Jersey. What that means is I do the weather for 14 different radio stations across New Jersey. Our flagship is New Jersey 101.5. Before I go further, I do have something very important. Hang on, very important. I have to tell you, that today is mostly sunny with high temperatures in the lower 70s and the Memorial Day weekend's looking great. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. I could just talk about weather for the next hour instead of this if you'd like. I mean, that's what I do. Um, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I think this is important because it shows you kind of where I come from and where my career has been so far. And that gives you a little bit of insight because I'm at a different point in my career. I'm a middle career uh, than you guys will be when you graduate high school or college or, or even a couple years after that. I grew up in beautiful Jackson, New Jersey, where we're sitting right now. In fact, my, my Paramount... Um, TV and film um, production my senior year at Jackson Memorial High School, uh, they asked me to produce a video for the school district explaining why we needed a second high school here in Jackson. And here it is, this school was built because of me, because I made a video, yay, all right. Maybe one day they'll name it after me, although probably not. Um, I did the weather even back in, in middle school and in high school. It was always a passion of mine. I wanted to be on TV to tell that story. So I, uh, I started right here in Jackson, and eventually I went to Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. That's one of the eight Ivy League schools. I learned some hardcore math and science, and also got my practice in TV production at NBC10 in Philadelphia, and uh, also the student radio station at Cornell. I started my professional career at KSWO television in Lawton, Oklahoma. Anybody ever been to Lawton, Oklahoma? Yeah, it's the middle of nowhere, but it is a really good place to learn about the weather because we have tornadoes out there and all kinds of crazy thunderstorms. Very much a culture shock having grown up here in New Jersey, but a great place to start my career. I was there for two and a half years. Then I came back to Elmira, New York, and I was on WENY TV. I spent some time on News 12 New Jersey right here in uh, Edison. I did the weather. I covered, uh, this was from Tropical Storm Irene. I helped to cover Sandy back in 2012, and I've been at New Jersey 101.5 for almost nine years now. It's fascinating. It is insanely busy. My workflow is cram-packed every day with 49 weathercasts for radio on top of responsibilities for our websites and apps. When the weather gets really bad, it's even more intense and it becomes 24-7 and I sleep on the floor of the radio station. It is nuts, but I love it. It is a fun challenge every single day. And occasionally I get to come out in the community and talk to cool people like you guys, so that's good. The one other thing you need to know is the reason why I work so hard. My beautiful family, my wife Amy, sons Jackson, Griffin, Nathan, and not seen in this picture is baby number four coming one month from today. So weather daddy of four. Thank you, thank you. And thank you to my 35-week pregnant wife for letting me come here today and, uh, and do this. This is, this is like my fifth or sixth time I've gotten to talk here at the, at the film workshop and challenge. I always enjoy it. I always like to bring kind of my different perspective. So let's, let's jump in and let's talk about job searching. This map, every dot represents a place that I applied for a job for in my first four years in the business. I haven't updated this in a while, but my first two or three job searches, every dot here, represents a TV station or radio station that I applied to be a broadcast meteorologist. There are a lot of them, and the reality is there are 
a lot of jobs and a lot of people who want to take those jobs. It is a very competitive industry. Um, in many cases, it's not very well paid, although that's gotten better in recent years. But needless to say, I've had a lot of experience putting together resumes and demo reels and sending them off and going through interviews. So that's kind of where I'm coming from here. Throughout my talk, I want to make this semi-interactive. Um, we'll probably have time for questions at the end, but um, let's, let's just kind of go old school and take a poll here with the number of fingers on your hand. Uh, what is your current grade level? Give me a sense for who we're talking here. Freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. As I expected, we've got a nice mix of everybody. Some people not holding their hands up, so they have no idea what year they're in. That's a problem. Okay. I see, I see a lot of upperclassmen, so this is going to be very relevant to you um, in the next couple years, either as you apply for colleges where you will need a resume for that, or as you enter the workforce. Okay, next question. How comfortable and knowledgeable are you about finding a job? We're talking about putting together a resume and cover letter, going to interview for a job, finding jobs. How comfortable are you on a scale of one, not at all, two, a little, three, a lot, or four, very? What do you think? I think two is the resounding answer. I see some threes, I see a four, I like the confidence. So a little bit, we know a little. Hopefully we can bump that out up one finger level by the time I'm done talking here. If, if you can come away with one or two nuggets of information, um, then, then this has been a success. I remember being in your shoes and your seats and having absolutely no clue how this works. So hopefully this will be a good introduction. If you've already thought about this, if you already have a resume, um, hopefully this will be helpful for you when you take the next step. Benjamin Franklin once said, if you fail to plan, you are planning to fail. A lot of what I'm talking about here is about being strategic. When you're trying to start your career, when you're trying to find a job, everything you, need, everything you do needs to be strategic. You can't just slap this stuff together. You're really not going to find great success. I've had I think, great success in, in finding jobs, and I'm going to tell you some of those stories later on. But you really need to plan, you need to have a plan, and you need to have some strategy here. I mean, you're at the very beginning of your road journey, eventually, hopefully, leading you to retirement, and there's a lot of twists and turns along the way. More accurate graphic might be to show you some spaghetti, because really, you don't know where your career is going to take you. I'm sure there are lots of people in this room who have no idea what you're going to do with your life. And that's okay. I'm sure you hear that from guidance counselors and teachers all the time. You don't need to know what you want to do. Maybe you have a spark of an idea in your head, um, and who knows where the next path will lead you? Who knows what next twist or turn may come your way? I won't necessarily be doing broadcast meteorology for the rest of my career. I have lots of other skills that I can, I can rely on, that I can fall back on. So maybe I'll follow a different strand of spaghetti one day. Today's Getting a Job Toolbox, we're going to start by talking about your resume. We'll discuss the cover letter and how important that is or not. Uh, we're going to go through a little bit on portfolio. Since you guys are all here, presumably you've done some work in the world of media and film, so you've already started a portfolio in some way, shape, or form. We'll talk about interviewing and networking, and we'll wrap things up with some general advice. All right, so of those things that I just talked about, which of these is the most important element when applying for a job? Is it the resume, the cover letter, your portfolio, or the interview? There's no right answer to this question. I'm just kind of curious what you guys are thinking. What is most important of all of those? And I think I see an even distribution of just about every answer out there. I see lots of ones and threes, which is resume and portfolio. That makes sense. Thank you. Um, I think the answer to this question is, it depends. It depends on what you're applying for. You know, when I was applying for TV meteorology jobs, my portfolio, my demo reel, was really all that mattered. News directors just wanted to see what I looked like and what I could do on camera, and then they would go to the resume, and then they would look at the cover letter and, you know, figure out if I was a good fit for their organization. Question? So resume is a, a paper document that lists all of your experience, your education, your work experience. Um, portfolio is, is more physical. That's like links to the work you have done. So maybe that's videos or photos. Um, they are very similar, you're right. Um, but you know, resume is just the list. And then portfolio, you know, when I think portfolio nowadays, I'm thinking like a website that has links to, to all your different things. But they may look very similar. All right, so let's jump into the resume here. 
And the truth of the matter is, when you apply for a job, more than likely, there are going to be a lot of other people, highly qualified people, applying for that same job. Um, if you're familiar with the website LinkedIn, maybe some of you guys have a LinkedIn profile, really cool job search tools there because it will tell you how many other applicants have applied for that job, how many other people, when you look at a job, have clicked the apply button. And a lot of times, there are hundreds of people that have clicked that apply button. And that kind of gives you an idea of, oh, this is a popular job, I better be really qualified for it. Or on the flip side, oh, there aren't a whole lot of people applying. Why is that? Is it a niche kind of thing or is it a scam kind of thing? Um, in general, real jobs will have quite a few applications. I know in the world of TV meteorology, um, when I got my job in Oklahoma, granted this was 15 years ago, uh, my news director shared that I was the top pick out of 60 applications that they got. And this was before the age of YouTube and digital videos. We had to send in a VHS tape with our application and that's how they viewed us. So they got 60 tapes and I was the best out of all of them. I was very, very lucky to, uh, to fall into that uh, to start my career. So uh, rule number one for your resume at your stage of life is that it should be one page long, period, full stop, that's it. You just don't have the experience, probably, to put on your resume just now. If you have some experience, if you've won awards, if you've done some really world-class things, there are exceptions to this rule. But for an entry-level resume, one that we're sending off to colleges, one that we're sending off for our first or even second job in the world, you're looking at one page filled with text, broken into sections. We'll talk more about the design of a resume in a minute. Now, in the world of media specifically, I will tell you that experience is way more important than education on your resume. This is something that was told to me at a workshop just like this. I think I was in college at the time. And they told us, put your work experience on top of your education. And I'm like, no, that's BS. I paid a lot of money for my degree. I worked really hard. I'm in an Ivy League school. It's going at the top of my resume. But I get it now. You want to show what you can do more than what you've learned necessarily in school. Your education's important. It should be on there somewhere. But with the resume examples that I'm going to show you, you are going to mostly see the work experience is right at the top. We want to show what you can do, what you have done right off the bat. You might see something as you're looking through resume templates or if you go to a specific resume workshop that says you need an objective statement at the top of your resume. Something along the lines of, I am looking for an adventurous career in television and film production, uh, and that's it. That doesn't say very much. It doesn't say very much about you. It really doesn't say very much about what you're looking for. It's boring and it just fills up space. So my recommendation for the very tippity top of your resume would be something like a summary of qualifications. And this is literally one from, from my previous uh, work as a, a meteorologist applying for jobs. Certified broadcast meteorologist with a diverse background in weather forecasting, applied meteorology and climatology and television and radio broadcasting. Thorough knowledge of severe weather dynamics and extensive experience with severe weather cut-ins and wall-to-wall -wall coverage. Passion for conquering challenges and exceeding expectations with enthusiasm, efficiency, and accuracy. So number one, that shows my future employer that, okay, I can write sentences, I can do that. Um, but if they don't read anything else, this gives you a pretty clear picture of what I can do and what I specialize in right at the top. It could also be a block of text that says basically the same thing. It's, uh, it's kind of a, a personal taste thing. But rather than talk about an objective, what you're looking for, talk about who you are. Just a couple of sentences, keep it concise, and keep it professional. All right, next up is keywords. And this has to do with the fact that when you apply for jobs today, you're doing it online. Right? Nobody goes to a building and hands in a paper application anymore. You go on the website, you search for the job, you go into their system, and uh, you upload your resume and fill everything out. This is working that system a little bit, in that modern resumes have a list of skills, things that you are good at. Some of those skills I even put in my, my qualifications. For me, I might put you know, weather forecasting and severe weather. I might go as far as to be specific with tornado forecasting. 
Part of this is also talking about software packages that you are comfortable with. So you might list Adobe Premiere and Final Cut Pro. In my case, I use Adobe Audition to do audio editing. Um, in my case, I'm using iNews, which is our software that um, uh, stacks our, our newscasts in the newsroom. Software, hard skills, soft skills, things like personality, things like public speaking, anything you're good at, you include, because when your application gets submitted, the computer's gonna look at you first, and it's gonna look at your resume and say, hmm, is this person actually a good fit for this job? And this is a big contributor to that score that you're automatically going to be given. So keywords somewhere should have a spot on your resume in some way, shape, or form. I wanna point out that this sample resume here has a section called skills, and it has like these little bar graphs that show how comfortable this person is with these various software things. I actually don't, like those personally, these little, like, like sometimes you might rate your, what's your skill in Final Cut Pro on a scale of one to five stars? What is that scale? Does one mean you don't know it at all? Does one mean you're really bad at it? Does one star mean that you're just a beginner and you're still learning? So I think just listing keywords rather than rating keywords is a, a far better way to go about things. I also hate this one because this word cloud just looks stupid on the bottom of the resume. You could, you could find a much better use of that space, I think. All right, I always like putting in a hint of personality into my resumes. It's not all professional. Granted, I would not put on my resume personally knows Olaf and likes to give warm hugs. Although, as a meteorologist, this actually would be a relevant picture to include. Meteorologist hanging out with a snowman, yeah, that's great. Um, what I mean is that at the bottom of the resume, I have a section on mine called other qualifications or special qualifications or notes. And I put in the fact that I enjoy going to Disney World and I like drinking wine and I like Broadway musicals. Couple things that might um, your interviewer down the road might latch onto and want to talk about. Last job I applied for at News 12 New Jersey, the assistant news director, oh, she loves Disney World. And we talked about it for a very long time. That worked out great. Another interview I had on my resume, I listed that I'm a Cub Scout den leader for my son's um, Cub Scout pack. And the guy I was interviewing with, Eagle Scout, all involved with the Cub Scout district, Boom, it's an in, it's a plus in your column. You just want to hit upon a couple things that someone might find interesting about you and might ask about you down the road. And the last point on resumes is to consider the design very carefully. You want to think about what it looks like. And especially in the media, especially in a visual art, this is kind of showing what you can do. This is, this is kind of a point on your portfolio, if you will. Can you design something that is functional? Can you design something that looks really good? Now, we're going to take these four on screen and make an example of them. I'm going to give you a poll question about which one is better. Okay, so we have this first one, which is, you know, plain white background with lots of text. We have this one. The guy included a, a picture of himself. It's got two columns laid out very cleanly. This one on rainbow paper, ooh, and this one, which is um, very concise. So, which one do you think is the best overall? One, two, three, or four? There's not a right answer, but there are two that will hopefully stand out to you. And I think everybody in the crowd is listing, almost everybody is listing one of the two Best. Two is by far the, the most popular answer. I see a couple of threes, but it's one and two that I want to I wanna kind of look into here. And I'll go back here so you can see. Um, first of all, the rainbow paper, that's a little much. It might help you stand out if, if there's a reason for it. Maybe if you're applying to be a preschool teacher, rainbow paper might be appropriate, okay? If, uh, if you're gonna be a technicolor supervisor or something, okay, something, something niche like that. Uh, when I was applying for colleges, meteorologists, I put my resume on cloud paper, you know, like a little sky blue paper. It was subtle, it was cute. I don't do that anymore. I, I don't think it would be quite professional at this stage. Number four, it's a little too short, it's a little too sparse, there's a bit too much white space. You need to show what you can do and what you know, and that's not showing very much. Now, I'm gonna tell you a little secret. Number two, that's the one I picked for my resume. This is my actual resume as of this winter. 
uh, I think it's really pretentious to include your headshot on your resume. I think that shows a giant ego. And let me tell you something, I got a big ego. Um, for something like TV, it makes sense to have my picture on there. Remember, they're gonna have my portfolio, they have my demo reel, they know what I look like. So that is not a problem for me. It does not work for everything. It's not appropriate for every job. Now I have the two columns here, and you can see my work experience is right there. That's, that's the big white section. And then the blue section, I've got my contact info and my education and uh, affiliations, there's my keywords, and then my other experience. And for this particular job, other experience, I decided to key into the fact that I used to operate roller coasters at Six Flags Great Adventure. I don't remember why I included this on this specific resume, but there had to be a reason. I was trying to latch on to something that the hiring manager would see and, and enjoy. This might have been for, for NBC10 in Philadelphia, so that they know that I'm a local and, and this is where I grew up. There's a problem with this resume though. When you upload this to job applications, it gets confused. It can't, the computer can't read this because it's two columns, because the design is funky. It can't read it and know this is the education, this is the work experience. So I don't use this resume anymore. I use this one. Nice and clean. Now remember, I'm middle career, that's why I'm allowed to use two pages, but everything is in order. Everything is in Microsoft Word, nice and clean, so that when I submit this, and that system scans over my resume and looks to see if I'm appropriate, if I wanna pass that initial check, it can actually do that and find where all my stuff is. So this is what I use now when I apply to jobs. And yes, I'm always applying to jobs, as should you. It's part of being a professional. You should always be looking. We'll talk about that more in a minute. But this is what I use. And it's also easier for me to update. If I'm applying for a specific job, maybe one that's heavier on data science, I'll include certain things that I wouldn't if it were like a straight TV job, for example. So there you go. And if you noticed, I actually left my real phone number on those resumes. So if you took notes, you can text me after the show and ask me more questions. I don't know why I didn't censor that out. <laughs> All right, cover letter. <laughs> so cover letter is also important, sort of. Um, the goals of a cover letter, to summarize your qualifications and to go beyond the resume. This is to talk about you know, who you are professionally, a little bit who you are personally, and show why you are the perfect fit for the specific job that you're applying for. It should not be generic. It should show that you've done some research into a specific company and into a specific job. You should demonstrate your personality. You're also demonstrating your writing skills that you can write you know, a five, six, seven paragraph essay and not sound like a total doofus and do it without typos and errors. You can also pass along your best contact information. Of course, my contact information also on there again. I gotta work on this. <laughs> Let's talk about what a cover letter is not. It should not be a copy and paste of your resume. You can highlight certain things, but they're gonna have these two documents side by side. So you don't have to necessarily recap your resume. They're gonna have it. Cover letter is not all about you. That's kind of confusing. But as I said, this is about how you fit into a specific job, into a specific organization. So it should have some level of, of personal connection along those lines. It should uh, not be dramatic or too personal or negative. You should have no errors in it. And to be honest, uh, a cover letter might grab some attention, but it's not going to make or break a hiring decision. It's not gonna be a matter of, I really like this guy's resume, he's got a good reel, but oh, that cover letter was terrible. I can't possibly hire them. It might put you a little higher or lower on the list, but uh, I don't think anyone's uh, making or breaking it on a cover letter. All right, next question. When should you include a cover letter with an application? One, never, two, sometimes, three, always. What do you think? When do we include a cover letter with our application? I see twos and threes. My latest answer is somewhere between one and two. I'll tell you, it's, it's rare nowadays. Uh, and here's why. Because you're applying online, right? Sometimes there's not a space for a cover letter. Sometimes there is. Sometimes there's a nice little block where you can just copy and paste it in, or you can upload a, additional supplementary information, as they call it. 
Um, I will always write a cover letter for something I'm applying to, but if there's not a great place to plug it in on an application, sometimes I'll include it, sometimes I won't. If I know who the hiring manager is, I might send it to them via a separate email, separate from the job application, attach my resume to that email. That's also an effective way to work that. But cover letter, it's not mandatory. Your guidance counselors may tell you otherwise. Your career counselors may tell you, you gotta have a cover letter. But in reality, not gonna make or break your hiring decision. Be careful though, if the job description asks you for a cover letter and asks for specific things, you better include one because they're gonna be looking for that and they're gonna be looking for that information. Here's another tip. AI has taken over the world, right? Pretty soon humans won't have to do anything. And I've been experimenting in my professional and personal life with what ChatGPT can do for me. You know, can you come up with a headline for my weather article? And yeah, it does a pretty good job at that. Can you transform this weather forecast into a quick summary that I can copy and paste on Facebook? It can do that too. And you can use AI in your job search. Now we're gonna be careful here. Okay, because there's some ethical gray area involved when you're having a computer write stuff for you, right? Would you let AI, ChatGPT, write a paper for you in school? Probably not, right? I'm, I'm sure your teachers have some defenses against that. It wouldn't really teach you much and it's not your work. But for a cover letter, it can be a great starting point. So, you know, you might give ChatGPT your resume and a job description and say, write a cover letter to include with my job application. I literally did this, it did a pretty good job. I would have to go through and edit it a little bit, change paragraphs around, add some personal details, but it was pretty professional and a really good start. You might ask um, a, little, a little less specific, what skills and experience should I highlight? So don't write the cover letter, but tell me what in this job description and what in my resume are particularly good matches for me to include. And then the last one, which is probably my favorite, I give them my resume and my job description and a cover letter, and I say, critique this cover letter. And it's harsh. It'll tell you exactly what's wrong with that cover letter. I mean, I think it, it called me pretentious in, in a per certain part of my cover letter because of some sentence or phrase, and then it suggested something different. I had some choice words for the computer after that point, but again, this is a tool. This is a tool in your toolbox, writing a cover letter about yourself, especially for every single job you apply to, that can be tedious. But that's the benefit of AI, taking over our world to make our lives easier and to do these kinds of tedious jobs for us. All right, let's roll into the next part of our application, the portfolio. And this has to do with content. Content rules the world in media. It's kind of a buzzword, but it is what it is. It's what we work with. Um, in my world, you know, my content is audio on the radio. My content are infographics and texts that I post on the web. I used to do daily videos that I don't have time for anymore. That's all content. I'm sure if you sit down and think about the content you've produced, you already have a pretty good list. You've got whatever you entered for the film challenge, maybe some other TV and film productions. Maybe you've done some things in art class or, or design work. Maybe you've written some really cool papers for class, for English class or history. That can all be part of your portfolio. That can be all part of your personal content archives. Now I'm going to tell you, you need a professional digital footprint. For me, it's an important part of my job. You know, I'm, I'm posting to Facebook and Twitter every morning. I've got 27,000 Facebook fans that I'm very proud of, that I try to take care of as much as I can. But even now, in high school, having a LinkedIn is a pretty good idea. Because here's what's gonna happen. You submit your job application, you make it through the automated checks, it lands on a hiring manager's desk, and the first thing they're gonna do is Google you. They're gonna look you up if, if, if they can, and you want to try to game those search results so that something good shows up at the top. I'm not saying that you have bad things lurking on the dark web about yourself, but if they see a LinkedIn profile or you know, a Facebook profile that doesn't include bad stuff, if they find a Twitter feed of you doing professional things, all your film projects, that's going to be brownie points for you in, in the plus column. All right, the point of a portfolio is showcasing your best work. And it does need to be said that when you're putting together some sort of portfolio, you need to not showcase your non-best work. 
In other words, you don't have to be comprehensive. You don't have to show every single project you've ever done. Just show them the best stuff. So when I create a demo reel, when I'm applying for TV weather jobs, the first 30 seconds is a montage, a couple clips here and there, and then I'm going to show them one really good weather show, a great forecast where I'm really telling a story. I created some killer graphics to talk about the severe thunderstorm outbreak that's rolling in. Your best work, what you consider to be tops, and you might ask friends and colleagues, what is your best work? Which video is better, this one or this one that I produced that I should really highlight and showcase? When you're putting together a reel in particular, you want to start with a bang, end with an explosion, and keep it simple. Um, this comes from YouTube. This graphic shows a second-by-second -second outline of who watched my most recent demo reel. I have a couple hundred views on it, so it's not a great sample size. But you can see, here's 100% of viewers start the video, and then within the first, this is probably the first 30 seconds, I lose half my audience. And that's typical. When you apply for a job, they want to see what's off the top, what do you lead with, what is your bang, and then if you get them to hang on, it's that middle part where you put you know, a variety of content, a variety of stuff to look at, and then you end with an explosion or else you get another little drop off in the last few seconds here. I think I have a slate at the end of my demo reel, which is why people stop watching here instead of here, just for the record. So beginning is absolutely most important, End is important to leave them feeling high about your work. Now, if you're making a demo reel in particular, so this is for an on-air position in news or otherwise, uh, or behind the scenes, you know, there are director reels and writing reels, camera work reels, absolutely. I like starting with a montage, five to six clips that are five to six seconds each, keeping it brief. And the highlight here is that if they want more from you, they will ask you. They're not going to look at a reel and say, oh, this was great, but it's so short. I'm not going to call them for an interview. I'm not going to hire them. If they like your work, if you're qualified for that job, they will absolutely ask you for more. Maybe something more specific. Maybe they will ask you to come in for an audition. That was, uh, in my case, my most recent application just a few months ago with News 12 New Jersey coming back for them. They had me come in and do a live audition for them because they wanted to see how I would interact with anchors and graphics and, and do in their studio. So, you know, there's always the opportunity to, uh, to include some more. Question? How brief do you mean to say brief? Do you mean like 30 seconds, a minute? As long as it takes. It depends what that content is. Um, in my case, you know, I'm, I'm showing weather content. So a, an average weather cast is two and a half minutes. So I've got a 30 second montage, a two and a half minute weather cast, usually a minute of something special, like if I did a story about a tornado outbreak, something else that's relevant, and that's it. So in my case, it's less than five minutes. But you know, if you're doing more like long form film, there might be more to it. There might be more meat that you have to include. Don't include more than you have to is, is kind of where I'm going with that. Yep. Um, going back to what you were saying before, when somebody like looks up your name on Google. Yep. Um, so what if you have like the same name as somebody who's like went to jail and like. <laughs> That's a very good question. So. Okay, so the question is, what if somebody else has your name? That's absolutely a valid concern. Hopefully the hiring manager would be smart enough to realize that, especially if you're in different cities, different states, different situations. And that's even more reason to try to game the, the system, game the search algorithms, so that when they're searching for you, you know, maybe they'll put in your name and your town, and hopefully then it'll pop up your LinkedIn profile right on the top, exactly what you want to show them. Great question. I'm glad you're thinking about things like this, right? Because these are, this is part of the strategy. This is part of planning your plan ahead of time. All right, so that's all I'm going to say about portfolio, because the, the truth of the matter is it's different for everybody. What you may include or whether you include a portfolio is going to be very different based on your situation. Let's move on to the interview. Interviews, you're either going to love them or you hate them. I have always liked interviewing. Back in high school in the academic decathlon, I was a bronze medal in the interview competition. Yeah, that's right. I'm that good in it. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. But stop clapping. I didn't get gold. I only got bronze. I mean, you know, yeah, that's right. Better than nothing. That's right. Uh, but I've been on a great many interviews uh, over my time. Some of them have went very well. I'm, I consider myself successful in my career. Some have not. And I'm going to tell you my biggest interview horror story in just a minute here. 
the big question you're probably going to get right off the bat in your interview is, tell me a little bit about yourself. This isn't necessarily in every interview. I shouldn't say that because if the hiring manager or the recruiter has done their homework, they already know your resume, they know their cover, your cover letter, they're not going to waste time with this question, but it should be one that you are prepared to answer. It's your elevator pitch, right? Um, maybe you've heard of this term. You imagine yourself getting into an elevator with someone who is the very top of your field, someone who could really make your life better, make your career better, you have 30 seconds from the time you go from the ground floor to the top floor to introduce yourself and to impress them. How do you do that? Very intimidating. There's not a perfect answer to this, but let's try to put together some elements of how to answer, tell me a little bit about yourself. Number one, you talk about who you are. You can't answer this question without talking a little bit about your background. I'm a broadcast meteorologist. I've been interested in the weather since I was 10 years old. My career has stretched from Tornado Alley to back here in the Northeast. Then you talk about what you can do. I specialize in telling the weather story. It's my favorite part of the job, is figuring out how to communicate what the atmosphere is going to do to my audience. Thunderstorms and blizzards and hurricanes, I've experienced it all. Why you're here. I think this job is a perfect fit for me because I've been a big fan of this organization for a long time. I'm very familiar with your product, and I think I'd be able to fit in with the culture here very, very easily and provide great service to your audience. That's it. If you cut all those clips together, it's probably 30 seconds. You don't have to ramble on and give your complete career chronology, quick, who you are, what you can do, and why you're there. That's not the only hard interview question, though. Here's a few more. Why should I hire you? Because I want money. Duh. Um, I don't know that there's a great answer for this. I think it's very specific based on, based on the company, um, but I think the answer is also very similar to what we just talked about, okay? Talk about your strengths and why you're a good fit. One question that I used to ask uh, when I did interviews, I worked for a test prep company and I had to hire teachers all the time. I asked, what is your greatest weakness? Here's the secret about this question. Doesn't matter what you say your greatest weakness is. I want to hear how you can overcome that weakness. So my weakness might be something like, I'm terrified of failure. I'm a perfectionist. And sometimes that affects my time management skills. But that's something that I'm working on. I have a daily workflow that goes ABC so that I can, I can work through those issues. Doesn't matter what your answer is. It's how you answer it. Tell me about a time when, when they give you, they want you to give an example. This is very common. You will absolutely see this in an interview. And here's my little secret. You can lie a little. You can kind of make up a story. We don't want to be completely fabricated or else you're going to end up like that congressman on Long Island who completely made up everything and still got elected to Congress. We don't want to lie. We don't want to be outright you know, um, malicious about it. But it's OK if you exaggerate a little bit. They're never going to know. And if it helps to tell the story of why you're a perfect fit, I personally think it's OK. Sometimes you'll ask, they'll ask for a project, or they'll give you a little test. Um, this is becoming more and more common. Interviewing has become way more complicated than it used to be. Um, one of the jobs that I applied for recently, there were four rounds. I had to sit with a recruiter, and then I sat with um, the, the, the talent specialist, and then a news director, and then the assistant news director, and all of them were, you know, this high-stress interview situation. This is the case now. They want you to meet different members on the team to make sure you're a good fit, and sometimes they'll test you. You know, they'll ask you to create a weather forecast on the fly, in my case, or maybe they'll ask you, you know, uh, if we go back to what uh, David was talking about in the session before, which camera shot, which angle would be most appropriate? How would you light the scene if that was relevant to the job you're applying for? So, you know, what can you do in that circumstance except give the best answer? Take a moment to think and then just be yourself and, and use your experience, use your education to answer the question. My least favorite question in every interview that I've ever been on, what is your salary expectation? Um, a lot. Again, I don't have a good answer for it. I am so uncomfortable throwing out the first number. I hate it, but it always comes up. The good news is that a lot more job postings nowadays are listing this is the approximate starting salary in the posting. So that gives you something to start with. But you know, 
you could search for this topic online and you'll see videos and articles about how to answer that salary expectation. Um, I'm of the opinion that you should give them a number. You shouldn't hem and haw and say, well, I'd like to make a lot, but maybe your budget isn't a lot, so I'll take whatever you have to give me. That's not going to earn you points on this question. You should give them a range, give them a reason for that range, and you know, hope you didn't undercut or overcut their expectations. Should you say higher or lower than what you'd expect? I don't know. <laughs> um, you don't want to lowball yourself because, you know, let's say if a hiring manager, they're always going to have a number in their head of what their budget is. So if their budget is, let's say, $80,000 a year, and you say, well, I could see 60 to 70,000, guess what you're getting paid? 60 to 70, and they get to save that money on their budget. So it's a real dicey thing. And that's why I say there's not a great answer for it. Um, you know, don't be scared to give a wide range if that's necessary. Do some research. There's some sites out there that'll give you average salaries for, for certain positions and certain companies. So there's, there's um, insight to be found. All right, next tough question. What do you do for fun? That's not a tough question. Oh, but it is. Let me take you back to 2006, May 2006. I had just finished my final, final exam in college, and I got a phone call from a news director in Salisbury, Maryland, that they got my application, they liked what they saw, I grew up on the East Coast, come on down, let's do an audition and an interview in beautiful Salisbury, Maryland. Nice, nice, part, of the, nice part of the country. It's like three, four hours south of here. So I went in and we talked, chief meteorologist there and I, we hit it off right away. And then I sat down with the news director. And I think this guy was having a bad day because it was just a sour mood the entire time. And then he asked me, all right, you seem to know your stuff when it comes to weather. What do you do for fun? Now, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a college student. I'm gonna graduate college and enter the real world. What I did for fun in college was study and go to clubs and go to the library. I don't know what I'm doing in the real world because I'm not there yet. So I said, I don't know, nothing. That was basically my answer was nothing. I do nothing for fun. And they're trying to hire me to be, you know, meteorologist on a morning TV show and I don't do anything outside of work. That was a really bad answer and that's probably part of the reason why I did not get the job there. Um, they were also specifically looking to hire a woman, which I am not. That is the truth of the TV business. My good friend Danielle got the job, so good for her. She had a great time with it. She works in Tennessee now, so it worked out great for her. But I don't know, maybe have a hobby that you'd like to highlight, um, and uh, just in case that, that question gets thrown out at you. And then lastly is, any questions for me? This is how practically every interview ends, and you should always have questions that you wanna ask. Prepare one or two and see where the, con the, the conversation goes. The last question you should ask is, what does the hiring process look like from here? That's how you end the interview is you ask, okay, what happens next? When will I hear from you? When are you making a decision? When are you hoping to hire by? Those are great questions. You might ask about the workplace culture. You might ask about benefits, which I know as high school students, benefits don't mean much, but to me, as a father of almost four, health insurance is rather important. Time off is also very important. Um, so have a couple questions that you, aren't things that you could Google, but things that you'd like the person to talk about and tell them about the opportunity. All right, here's a good one. Which type of job interview is the best? Number one, in person. Number two, a video call, like on Zoom or Teams. Or number three, over the phone. One, two, or three, in person, video call, or phone. Lots of number ones out there. I totally get it. You can show your best face, you can dress up all pretty, and you can go in there prepared and poised and ready for an offer. I actually prefer number two these days. Um, you guys might be a little tired of virtual learning and things, having been through a lot of that during the pandemic, but it really changed the way that businesses operate too. And I actually prefer, at least for an initial interview, to do a video call because, okay, I have the video call here, but then I have all my intelligence, all my insight about that company. I've got my resume, I've got the job posting, I've got their homepage, I've got the hiring manager's LinkedIn, I've got it all on the screen right next to where my camera is. So if I need to look something up, I can do that on the fly very quickly. Can't do that when you're sitting across the table from someone, but if you're on a video call, you can. 
Maybe I'm sneaky. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I, uh, I, uh, I like to be, uh, you know, covert. It's kind of like online dating instead of in-person dating. Speaking of which, I met my wife on online dating, so maybe that's why I like that route. But anyway, one or two. Phone interviews suck. You can never hear the other person. You can't see the other person. A lot of times, if you're applying for a big company, your first contact will be with a recruiter by phone. Recruiters are evil human beings. Their job is to weed out the people who don't get to move on to the next stage. And unfortunately, I've never met a corporate recruiter that I really, really liked. So. That first phone call, you just got to get through it and get on to the next round. More interview tips. Just like we talked about before, be concise. Say your answer and then stop talking. If they want to have a follow-up, they'll ask you a follow-up, but you don't need a five or ten minute answer for every question. Be positive. That goes without saying. Don't be negative about yourself. Don't be negative about former coworkers or former companies or about your education. Um, be honest and open, but only to an extent. Okay, remember, you're under the bright lights here in an interview. They're, they're scrutinizing every word you say, so don't be too honest, I guess. Uh, be friendly. Don't forget to smile. That's a big part of it. It is a dialogue. Both of you should do some talking. That's why you ask questions, and you don't necessarily have to save those questions for the end. Um, and then understand that it is a process. You know, you're trying to get this job, you're trying to show that you're the best fit, but put yourself in the shoes of the hiring manager. They're trying to get the best person to fill their job. So, you know, they're, they're doing their job. They're doing their best too. They've got a whole set of tips on their side of the table too um, that they're, they're trying to work through. So, you know, you, you work together and hope that everything works out in the end. Networking. This is not part of the job search process necessarily, but it should be something that you're strategically thinking about all the time. And I have to start with the greatest networking story ever, and that is with my current job at New Jersey 101.5 and how I got it. In 2014, I served on the board of directors of my college radio station, WVBR, and we were proudly cutting the ribbon on our brand new facilities. There's me, about 40 pounds heavier, no beard and with glasses. That was before LASIK. And my story is about this guy in the front row. His name is Warren Kurtzman, and he served on the board of directors with me. Uh, I knew him since my college days. He's a professional in the world of radio. He's president of Coleman Insights. They do research for radio stations all over the country. They have client radio stations all over the place. And um, on the day we were supposed to leave Ithaca after this ribbon cutting, uh, Warren was supposed to fly back home to North Carolina, and he was fogged in. No flights in or out of Ithaca because of fog. Hmm. So, you know, I told him, Listen, Warren, I live seven miles from Newark Airport. I could give you a ride to Newark, and you can get a flight home pretty easily. So he's like, yeah, okay, I'll hop on. So four-hour car ride with Warren Kurtzman, talking about the radio business. Now, at this time, I was working on News 12 New Jersey. I was on TV. I did TV weather. You know, he knew a lot about me. I knew a lot about him. So we got to talking about New Jersey 101.5, which was his client at the time. They had just gone through a rebrand. They had new sounders on the air. We, we had a great radio nerd talk on that four-hour car ride. And I literally said to him, you know, Warren, Alan Casper, who's the meteorologist there, he's been there a long time, but if he ever retires, I would love to have that job. Literally said that line in that car. Three months later, Warren calls me. Were you serious when you said you would love to have Alan Casper's job if he was retiring? Because he's retiring and the program director would like you to call him. Whoa, okay, I'll call him right now. Thanks, Warren. That's the story of how I got my job, because Warren knew the guy. His name was Eric Johnson. He ran the radio station back then. Alan Casper was moving on after a long 22-year career. Uh, they were having limited success in finding someone to replace him. It was kind of a, a quiet job search they were doing. My name came up, and uh, two months after that, I started as chief meteorologist at New Jersey 101.5. Pretty amazing. Thank you. This, this applause is for Warren. Let me tell you, the steak dinner that I treated him to the next time I saw him was huge. But I love telling the story because this is how networking works. You never know where your network is going to take you. So that's why you should be nice to everybody. Build your professional network so that it's there when you need it. Networking is organic. I like this comic with I asking the letter Y. So what can you do and how can I exploit it for my own selfish advancement? Networking is not going up to someone and saying, hi, I'd like to network with you. 
That's not what it is. Your network is like almost everyone you've ever met. It's, it's everyone you've ever interacted with in a professional setting. So that's coworkers, that's students here in high school and in college, it's teachers, it's administrators, it's people with whom you interviewed for previous jobs. If you had a great experience but it didn't work out, you can friend them on LinkedIn, who cares? You can network with me. Hi, if there's ever a job posted at 101.5 and you want an in, you email me, say, hi Dan, I was at your talk at the Film Challenge in 2023. I know you don't remember me and my name, but I was there. Can you help me with this? That's a connection. That's a, it's, it's not a strong connection, but it's a connection. It's an in, it helps you network. I am telling you, it is so much easier to apply for jobs when you have an in than when you don't. So networking is organic. You don't necessarily need to, you know, if you're at a conference, hi, hi, hi. That's not what it is, but when you meet people, you know, remember them. Exchange business cards, exchange contacts, like them on LinkedIn so you can follow them. Through your network, you build relationships, but don't burn bridges. You've probably heard this before. When you leave a job, you don't want to burn that bridge behind you. You want to leave that open. You want to be nice to those people. Also, if you're looking for a job, a tip that was told to me a long time ago, if you're searching, you tell everyone you know. You announce it on social media, you tell every family member, you call old teachers, old classmates, and tell them, I'm looking for a job, this is what I'm looking for. You never know where that spark is gonna come from. Pass your resume when it's appropriate, either by paper or by email. And remember, networking is a two-way street. I love to help my friends when I can. You know, working in a newsroom, if someone has a news tip for me about what their organization is doing, absolutely I'll pass that on. No promises that it'll lead to a story on the air, but sometimes it does. It's good to know people professionally. It's good to use your network. So just as we're coming up on time here, let's talk about some general advice. The student advantage. For the next one to seven plus years when you are a student, you have a huge advantage on the rest of the world. Students get doors opened for them that you won't have opened for you in the professional world. And that's mainly in the world of internships and externships. You know, if you emailed someone in the field, even someone prominent, someone famous in the field that you want to go to and say, hey, can I come shadow you at work for a day? they're probably gonna say yes, because you're a student and you're interested in the work and you wanna be them, you wanna be a professional like them. You can do that. If I did that, it'd be a little weird. Just as a professional, as a 30-something saying, hey, can I come to work with you? Mm, no, but job shadowing, externships, internships for credit, great way to build experience, great way to figure out what you wanna do. Use the time you have as a student very wisely. Now, as you're looking at your coursework, and when you go into, if you're going to college, if that's where your path takes you, think about the courses you're taking very carefully. Some people go to college thinking which courses are gonna give me the easiest A or the easiest homework load, but also think about, okay, what am I gonna do as a future career that, what, what classwork might help me get to that goal? If I could go back to college, I would take more classes in the world of like general earth science. I took a lot of meteorology, but Cornell had a class called Earthquake exclamation point. I really wish I took that class because sometimes I have to talk about earthquakes on the air and it would have been helpful to have that professional background. Um, making mistakes is part of the game. You want to try to make them when you're a student or an entry-level person and get them out of the way because you're always going to learn from those mistakes. Having a backup plan is always a good idea. You know, if broadcast meteorology doesn't work out, I could do this or this or this. I may have to go back to school or I may have to twist my resume a little bit, but that's a possibility. And finally, I mentioned it earlier, always be looking. The job search is a constant process. Even when you find a new job, you should always keep your eye open to other opportunities so you know what's out there, you know what you like. If you get let go or if it's time for you to leave on your decision, then you, know, you, you already have some background information. There's nothing wrong with submitting job applications even when you're employed. I will tell you secretly that in the last six months, I have submitted, I think, seven or eight job applications. Just always looking, what is that next step? What is that next door? Where am I gonna go? Who can I connect with? It's, it's just part of the deal. It's part of being a professional and especially in the media world. A few things we didn't discuss, how to search for a job, what happens when you get deep in the interview process, negotiating an offer and negotiating your salary, planning out your career, planning it around your family. These are all challenging things that you may also think about strategically. Mm -hmm. So right now, I'm 
in your job and you're sending out resumes, if you get like a callback on yep. that interview, what do you do? Like, can I vote? I probably can't have both. I have had two full-time jobs at the same time in the past. I wouldn't recommend it to my worst enemy. Um, you take it as far as you go and you see what comes of it. You know, those seven or eight applications, they all ended up not working out. They weren't the right opportunity for me. I wasn't the right fit for them. But, you know, there were things to think about. It was, uh, you know, just part of, the, part of the process. So when asking someone like to shadow for them, do you usually like email them, reach out to them through social media? Or what would you say is most likely? So how do you reach out to someone when you want to job shadow them? Email's probably a good bet because like everybody has a professional email address, um, but it depends, you know? It depends how, how high you want to go. If there's a famous, I don't know, famous director that you want to go check out on set for a day, you might have to go through a publicist or through an assistant or something, you know, do a little, do a little research and it doesn't hurt to send an email. The worst they could say is no, right? Uh, I had a cool shadow experience at CNBC when I was in, in school, and I had no interest in financial news, but just seeing that operation, seeing a national news network up close, it's, it's pretty neat. It's that student advantage. You know, you can do things and doors will be opened that aren't necessarily other places. So bottom line, be strategic and start now. If you don't have a LinkedIn page, go home and create one. Start that social media presence. Uh, when you're going through creating a resume, cover letter, interview, keep it simple, be positive and prepared, and always Always highlight your best stuff, not your non-best stuff. So that brings me to the end of my um, talk. Thank you so much for your kind attention. I know um, we're coming up on time here, and I know it's lunchtime, and we all want pizza. So there's my email address if you want to send me anything, if you want to network with me, or if you have any questions, feel free to come up. I'll be here for a few minutes, and we can, uh, we can talk. So uh, thanks very much, guys. Enjoy the rest of your day. Congratulations on your film projects, and uh, good luck with everything else. Thank you.